You've talked about the NFL and the work that you guys have been doing with HBCUs for years. Talk to me about, I know that you've emphasized the importance, but talk to me about how the NFL feels about all of this and the contribution the league itself feels that they can make to HBCUs directly. Well, when we look at the history of football and the impact that's, we don't talk about it often, but we can't talk about the success of the National Football League either on or off the field without talking about the participation of those who have come from historically black colleges and universities. So a few years back at the Super Bowl, if you all remember, we acknowledge those Hall of Famers, which most have had no clue, that have come from HBCUs. And the National Football League, we feel like that's we're, we're supposed to do that. But one, we got to acknowledge history and the greatness that comes from these historically black colleges, both men and women. So we want to do more, um, especially for those to those students that have been marginalized. We can do more. We can use our platform like you all are doing, allowing us to contribute, to be part. Troy, as a former all-pro corner, there's another guy who played cornerback pretty well for a couple years there, Deion Sanders, who's now going to be a head coach of an HBCU program. What does that mean for HBCUs to have one of the very greatest athletes who ever lived as a head coach? Well, I'm going to say the greatest and then arguably probably the best football player. I say Jim Brown was was at the – but when we talk about the best football player that have ever put on cleats, Deion Sanders is there. To have him with his profile become the head coach at Jackson – to raise the awareness to this. This is what the institutions uh, – they've been starving for, that they need high-profile coaches – he has eight legends coming on to coach with him. This is significant, not just for the National Football League, but for the HBCU community, hoping that this is, it, it increases enrollment, that it brings awareness to the institutions, frankly, that have been marginalized. So, so happy for Dion. Been working with him throughout this process and happy to see it come to pass this past week. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up because he was on the show yesterday, Troy, and he talked about obviously recruiting uh, that's going to be a big thing. You certainly expect prime time to be able to recruit. I don't think you select prime time Deion Sanders as your coach and don't think that he ain't gonna, he's not going to recruit for you. That's the number one thing he's going to do. Obviously, the uh, the end goal is to win, is to educate, is to nurture young uh, young men into uh, being full fledged men and contributors to our society in a very beneficial way. But one of the things he emphasized was the fact that at the NFL scouting combine. There weren't too many athletes from HBCUs, and that's what he wanted to make a strong contribution uh, towards, and he wanted to address that. What do you have to say about that as an executive for the National Football League? Are you concerned at all about the paucity of HBCU athletes that have shown up at the NFL Scouting Combine? Was that Absolutely. a legitimate point Steve, for Deion to bring up? Absolutely. And one of the things that we've, as we've looked and audit, myself personally and staff, when we look at the number of HBCU students that's participating or have been invited to the National Combine, when you look at one or two, unacceptable, when we see all other the, all the other institutions from Ivy, Division I, Division II, Division III are participating. You can't tell me when you look at the at least the four major conferences, the MEAC, the SWAC, the CI, CIAC, and the CIAA, that there are student athletes that can that can play at this level. So we need to create, and I've been working with actually Dion around this, one, an HBCU combine, which we'll have this March, where we can highlight HBCU student athletes. They have to be, we need to pr increase our their participation at the college all-star games. They're just lacking exposure. And that's mm. something that we control. And we got to do a better job of that. As the executive vice president of football operations for the NFL, Troy, you know, people were wondering, I was wondering, if you don't mind the transition to the field to play a little bit, what the quality of play would be like given the pandemic, no preseason, et cetera. We've seen some thrilling games. I think the best one we've seen so far is the Patriots uh, and the Seahawks. But we also have seen some incredibly dramatic games with kind of head-scratching moments like the Cowboys and Falcons. What was Atlanta doing? What is your sense about the level of play and the product that the NFL has put out so far early in the season? 
Max, great question. The quality of play in, in the it's been outstanding after two weeks of play. Points are up. Margin of victory is lower, about a little, little under 10%. Number, the formula, we, we, when we look at what qualifies or what quantifies good quality play, points, passes, plus penalties equal scores. And when we look at those categories, officiating, those penalties are down 13 this year, last year at this time, 19 penalties being called per game. This year, 13. Margin of victory, less than 10. Points, over 55. There's been some exciting games with no preseason. Quarterbacks are staying upright. That gives the, that gives the, it's, it's exciting to the fans. Tackling has been good. Haven't seen a lot of, we would say, early missed tackles, sloppy. The quality's been good. With the lack of fans, 